Hello and welcome to another National Inset Week 2016 podcast. I'm joined by Richard Bugman Jones today, author of many books. So thank you for joining us, Richard. Pleasure to be here. Now, first of all, could you tell us a little bit about your work as an author? What have you produced so far? Um, well, let's go back in in, uh, in time. The first book I ever produced was actually a rather technical book on beetles about new British British beetles that have been found, um, and that was great fun. But actually, one of the things I particularly wanted to do was to to tell other people about insects, not just entomologists. So most of what I've done is actually not specialist entomology stuff. It's very general introductory entomology stuff, and um, extreme insects was a lovely one. It was biggest, fattest, ugliest, longest, roundest, whitest, uh, sort of book of records of insects. Uh, Nano Nature was another one. But that, that, those were both fairly photo-led, so big coffee table books. And then I branched out to um, a little book of nits about head lice from very, in, uh, very personal experience of my children having head lice. That was a good one. Um, I wrote a book on mosquitoes for the Reaction Animal series, which was quite nice. That was a sort of cultural history, how animals have impinged on humans rather than biological analysis of them. And then the last book to come out was House Guests, House Pests, which was, as I said, insects and other animals which people find in their houses, why they're there, how they got to be there, something about our evolution and their evolution too. So your most recent book, House Guests, House Pests, has a little look about all of those often unwanted visitors for the public, they would say. Mm. Uh, what was the inspiration behind this book then? It's funny actually, that has been bubble- bubbling around for a very long time. I think the inspiration was, apart from the fact that I constantly, wherever I go, I never switch off. So there's the tale when I was at a dinner party in a friend's house in West Hampstead. And I looked up at the ceiling and I was able to identify the fly, the three millimetre long fly, walking across the ceiling from the way it waggled its wings. And of course, everybody thought this was utterly peculiar, which it was. Um, but wherever I go, I'm, people are slightly, are slightly worried what I'm going to find in their house. Uh, the famous one was when I was uh, staying with some friends in Western Supermare. I, I did a, a part-time, a short contract job for the BBC on The Really Wild Show back in the day and they wanted to get some death watch beetles to record the hammering Um, so I spent the day in the office ringing up um, rent to kill and various other uh, organizations university departments could I find a death watch beetle I was was convinced somebody would have a death watch colony no didn't exist so I was sitting then I'd go around and stay with my friends uh, Western Supermare and sitting on the sofa and a death watch beetle crawled across the sofa towards me. Of course, they were slightly horrified. They lived in a wonderful, uh, renovated 16th century house. And here was me on my hands and knees, uh, going around the back of the sofa, shouting, oh, I've got another one, look, fantastic. Um, but of course, wherever I go, I, I find insects. And if I see a, a speck moving out of the corner of my eye, my instinct isn't to swat it or curse or reach for the spray. It's what's that uh, but we do know a lot about the insects that occur in houses why they're, what they're doing in the houses but very few of those books ever say why they're in the house and that got me thinking about how all these other peculiar things we find in our houses from the cellar beetle to carpet beetle to the house moths clothes moths you know what on earth were they doing before humans arrived and of course once that process had started, I was off running with it. So this is one thing that you highlight in um, your book, is the difference in psychology between how we treat an insect outside and how we treat the exact same species inside. Did you look a bit at the psychology of... of well, I, I, it's funny actually because um, when I thought this was a good idea, I sort of roughed out a vague plan how I thought the book might um, might fit together. And part of that was actually looking at human evolution, about which I knew precious little. Trying to find where the first house was ever built, it's a complete mystery still. I don't think any um, any anthropologist or archaeologist would, would be comfortable saying it's definitely here and giving a time. And... 
Um, and again, where's, where's the first front door? Who put up the first front door? We don't know. Uh, but there's some, going back into that sort of research, there's some lovely terms I came across, and my favourite by far was the idea of the sacred space. And this is, it's a sort of ethnological, anthropological concept. And it doesn't matter if you live in a, in a hut or a mansion. The, the door is a psychological barrier more than a physical one. And it, it may just be hanging strings of beads or just a branch laid across it. But that door, and almost any human society, you don't cross that, that threshold unless you're invited. And if you do cross, most legal systems across the world empower you to resist with pretty extreme force anyone who's forcing their way into your sacred space. Um, and of course, the moment I came across that term, it, you realise actually that's what the insects who come into our house are doing. They're not just bumbling around, they're actually invading our private space. That we, it's not just a place where we live, it's a place that we've made our own. We have our family. It's imbued with a deep psychological uh, um, aura beyond just the, the bricks and, and concrete and glass and whatever that make up our house. And what about the inspirations for, for, for other books? Is there any um, situations where you have a eureka moment or is, are these pet interests that you have? Um, it's funny because the eureka moment might happen. There's lots of things. Writing a, a book is, as it were, a pretty self, um, self-absorbing process. It's just down to you. But actually, you've, you've got to find perhaps a publisher who's interested to publish it and you've got to convince them that people want to read it. So it's all very well having ideas, but um, you've actually got to take, you've got to at least have some idea of where it's leading to the finished product. The finished product will be useful or interesting or sellable to somebody. So the Dung Book, which is my next book I'm working on, uh, The Call of Nature, The Secret Life of Dung. Um, I tried to write a book about dung about 20 years ago. Again, they mostly be picture books with captions, but look at uh, a few very simple ecological lessons that children might take from this. And they went as far as mocking up some double page spreads and covers and the like. Um, and it never got any further than that, which is a real shame. And so that went onto the, onto the back burner for quite a long time until the success with House Guests. And, and once that was done and I was looking for something to follow it, the idea of dung came back into my mind because part of writing House Guest was I think I, I sort of found a voice to tell people about insects and, and rather than just being the, the textbook voice here is an insect is divided into these segments or look how, how many legs it's got, it's got six. so rather than that sort of rather, rather instructive and possibly repetitive uh, idea the, the ecological lessons were hooked around anecdotes connected to individual species, which had this weird thing about coming into our houses. So once I got that idea, uh, the dung book I was able to uh, come up with, on the basis that, again, there were all these ecological concepts of recycling, uh, nutrients, physiology, evolution, that I could, I could put into this book, and the, the dung would be the sort of overriding theme which drew it all together. And so I, I'm really pleased that I'm finally able to, to get this book out of my system. What would you suggest to young writers who um, they are interested in writing um, a book or articles, because you're, you're also a columnist for, for many magazines, um, what would you suggest is the best way to, to apply their trade? <laughs> uh, tricky one. Um, Write about what you know about, what you're interested in. I think um, any entomologist um, who wants to write is at an advantage because they've already got something that they know about that other people don't. Um, part of the fun about being an entomologist is having that sort of slightly eccentric um, behaviour, but also having a sort of store of arcane knowledge. It's very easy to fascinate somebody about what we think might be very simple concepts. So I think um, people, if any entomologist wants to write, they've already, they've already got a head start in that they know facts which nobody else knows. So 
that knowledge base is already there. Um, and the second thing is, um, obviously don't patronise your audience too much, but at the same time, you, you've, got to, you've got to make them interested in what you're saying. And the way I, I found to do it is to make it personal to me. I always write in the first person. And by telling people anecdotes about what you've done and how you fit into things, makes it, I think, much more personal, much more interesting to people. So if I'm describing how bees sting, I'll describe what it's like for me when a bee stings, because that's actually much more interesting to somebody rather than the mechanics of the venom sac or whatever, which you, you can then throw those facts in as well. Avoid uh, writing in the style of a, a scientific paper. Um, and just, just do it, just, just write a lot. And even if it doesn't get published, there's a great satisfaction in producing something and putting it on a blog, tweeting it. You know, you can have ten followers, or you can have a hundred thousand followers. But if if you're writing about something unusual, you you with only ten followers, people still come across your articles. So thank you for those personal insights into your experiences to being an author and an entomologist. So Richard, thank you very much for speaking to no, us. It's today. been a pleasure. Thank you. And if you want to find out more about uh, weird antics at dinner parties, then please do pick up House Guests, House Pests, and when is Call of Nature coming? Call of Nature should be out in September.